So I am joined by Matthew Torbett, who is former Labour advisor. Uh, love it when you come into the studio. We like to have a sort of nice Labour lefty voice on, and, and you <laughs> might happen to be my favourite. You good. and Matthew Lars are the two Matthews. Thank you very much. Um, right, let's talk about Chagos because something funny is going on here, and I don't really get <clears throat> what's happening. So we know that um, Trump's coming in and he doesn't seem to be too happy about the Chagos Islands being given to Mauritius, given the Diego Garcia base were there for 99 year lease, of course, still to the US to have that. Um, but it means that it sort of, you know, could compromise security, given that, um, well, we wouldn't own it anymore as uh, an ally of America. And there's concerns about the relationship between China and Mauritius, <clears throat> therefore being able to get eyes on to a very sensitive military base. Also, the fact that this uh, deal was sort of being really pushed over the line just before the elections in Mauritius. <clears throat> and the new guy, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I really am sort of suffering. They'll sort of have to pull me in on a, 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 a thingy, a sort of medical, what are they called? Stretcher. <laughs> stretcher, stretcher yeah, tomorrow, yeah. With an iron lung. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's weird that this was sort of really pushed over the line before the Mauritius elections. And the new uh, Mauritian president has turned around and said, I don't think I like the deal. I want some time to have a look at it. And I don't know why it was uh, done so close to our election. Um, let me reply, both you and I have said things during an election in order to get elected. You're not supposed to say that as a politician. Mm. Um, but what I don't understand is this. So America doesn't seem to want it now. Well, Trump's America doesn't want it. The new man in Mauritius doesn't seem to want it particularly, um, or at least wants to look at the details. A lot of Chagosians don't seem to want this. And yet, something that uh, Lamy has said is the process began under the last government and there were ministers who understand entirely why this is so important for our national security and global national security. But why? Why is it so important to global national security for Britain to give up uh, territory, strate ge geographically very strategic territory, to a country that's miles away from the Chagos Islands, who probably has more in common and better relationship with China. I can't see how that is in national security or global national security interests. Well, the Foreign Secretary is obviously hinting that there's something <clears throat> we're not really supposed to know for national security reasons. The problem he might have with that, and this is where somebody's clearly lying, because uh, you've got the, uh, the Conservatives going, no, we didn't start the process, and Labour going, well, you did, we've just sort of carried it on. So somebody's telling fibs somewhere, or something's not quite as it seems. I think you're right to point out that a majority of Chagossians don't want this. Um, I think Peter Lamb in Crawley, the Labour MP, new Labour MP for Crawley, has been very vocal on this, and uh, they have, Crawley has the largest um, amount of Chagossians that have left the islands to come and uh, live in the UK in his constituency. So there's outrage, because nobody was ever really consulted. And my fear for Labour on this is for something that is, in a way, quite, in the political sense, sort of minutiae, unless mm. you're sort of a, an armchair general or somebody that really is ingrained in the political process, you know, 99% of people outside don't know where the Chagos Islands is. If we were to go out and survey, I would wager. But because America now don't want it and the timing, they've obviously maybe potentially tried to tie the next president's hands if it wasn't to be Kamala Harris. Uh, and the same with the Mauritian, uh, Mauritius Prime Minister, if that's the case, then this could actually become a real big own goal because all that the, the general public will hear on the news when they sit down and watch it at 10 o'clock is something's happened and Labour's messed it up again and that will be the, the, the pro, poor preparation and the planning. So I, I'm not sure. Somebody's clearly not telling the truth in my mm. book um, and it might just be uh, a poor strategy again and a comm strategy from the Labour Party potentially. I just cannot see from the, the limited amount I know about geopolitics even though it's a subject that truly fascinates me the big battle going on around the world is largely for the control of um, maritime routes that's where it's at mm. these are the arteries that basically means fuel food fertilizer goods the entire globe's economy about 85 percent of the globe's economy moves around via sea routes mm -hmm. and it's also what you use militarily because guess what between lots of countries there's a heck of a lot of water those who control the seas really does have a bit of a sort of you know hand on a tiller when it comes to controlling the world and when it comes to this part of the world in particular um that's sort of nudging up down towards where china's really trying to dominate and have a big foothold um and so I cannot see the only persons 
the global position who seems to be bolstered by this would be China's. As much as I read this, I cannot see how it could possibly be in our interests when China's on the march, you know, really trying to grab up as much territory as it can. It'll find a sandbank somewhere near the Philippines and say, that's ours now, and start sort of, you know, lobbing things at Filipino mm. fishermen when it's their territorial waters. Any little bit of island, atoll, islet, mini unknown archipelago, China's there shoving a flag on saying, we want this. And this is the big concern. I cannot see in anyone's national interest in the West how this is strategically important. Again, it may be something we're, we're not really supposed to know, and that's why Lam is saying to the Conservatives, you need to pipe down, because you, I, we've had this situation when we were in opposition. I uh, used to work for an MP that was very vocal on the IRGC and why it should be prescribed mm. uh, as, a, as a terrorist group. David Lambert would raise it quite regularly and James Cleverly had to take a couple of, of us to the side after uh, Foreign Office questions or some sort of mm. urgent question and said, you know why we're not allowed to do that at the moment. So there was clearly something deeper where he was going, you know, if we were going to prescribe and we'd do it by now, but there was some sort of relationship behind the scenes or something, something was going on. So it might be something as little as that. I think the bigger question is, can you stop China? that they, they are on the march, they have the benefit of being a bit of a fraud democracy, therefore, if Xi wants to carry on, you know, spending things... And it's clever politics, you know, I, I, I never know how I feel about China, we have to be wary, but ultimately, when we had a foothold in much of the empire, we plundered a lot of stuff and left a lot of a bad taste in people's mouths. They're clever enough to go, we're going to start taking over, you know, patches of Africa and elsewhere, but we're going to build you... We're, patches? Well, large patches, <laughs> but we're going to build you some houses. We're going to build you some public services. We're going to well, build... So they're going, oh, actually, we don't mind this. All they're doing is upgrading the stuff that we built, though. Let's be fair, it's railway lines, it's sort of, you know, it's routes. And again, I think the fear is a lot of people think the Belt and Road Initiative is all about interconnecting points in which mm. China can go, right, we control that now. We can go from A to B, here to there, from this continent to that continent, from this seaport to this seaport, because we built it, and guess what? We're now going to seize it, and it's under our control, as well as a load of rare earth minerals. Um, but it does... I mean, they have... One of the very first visits... Uh, conducted by the Labour Party was to China. They, they sort of, you know, said we're going to... There hadn't been a sort of diplomatic handshake between China and the UK for a long time. And it is something that this government has prioritised at a time when America is going completely the other direction. Which is why maybe I would say it's strategically clever. If, if America is on the way in a little bit, I'm not saying, you know, we just jump into bed with China. Are China going to be using listening devices in this country more than likely? Are they going to be listening to politicians at the G7 and the G20? Yeah, probably. They've done it to Obama and others in the past. Is it worth keeping them close enough that they're not going to try and harm you massively when really we've been a country in decline for many decades now? And I hate to say it because it sounds like you're talking the country down, but I'd be denying reality otherwise. Well, we um, don't make anything anymore, so yeah. Well, no, totally. Gone. Since the industrialisation and us becoming a service-based <clears throat> economy, um, what are we? It's a lot of this maybe about because they've come out of the box really hard line about the net zero stuff. And mm. we know that if you want wind turbines, if you want solar panels, it's going to have to come from China. We don't have those factories here. They'll throw them up. We, you know, they're building HS2 for us. We haven't got the, 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 the access to finance that they have because part of it will be mismanagement, part of it is they're a massive country and, and President Xi's obviously got a... The an thing is, have you seen their debt-to-GDP ratio in China? Ours is sort of nudging about 100 now, isn't it? Mm. 100%. Some, sometimes a little bit below. I don't know where we're at at this exact moment in time. China's is about 250%. You're like, how on earth are you... I think they control a third of the world's debt, mm. as much as the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD creditor nations, all put together, China actually has even more debt, owns even more debt than that, and yet is the most indebted country itself. How does that work? It, because with debt become, it brings power. If you've got everyone in your pocket owing you, it, you can ignore your stuff in the background. And again, in my most darkest thoughts, I've thought, is democracy the problem? in this country at times. That's not me attempting <laughs> any sort of coup anytime soon. But you know... You've got your little czarist uh, beard yeah. there. <laughs> I think because China and, and places like that they, that don't really have a democracy can do long-term planning. Yeah, exactly. We've yeah, not been true. able to solve things so. like social care for, for God knows how long because you almost don't want to look at a 10 or 15 or 20-year plan because the other team might be in at that point and they're going to get the credit for well, it. Yeah, governments that make unpopular decisions don't stay governments for long well, in the exactly, democracy. exactly, and that's what we'll probably end up seeing with the Labour Party, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs>
But um, no, it is interesting. It's very di well, very different approach to a geopolitics. Mm. Let's say. Uh, let's sort of talk about unpopular decisions. The farmers they're still protesting. They're still at it. Uh, but it seems to me that the Labour government are intransigent on this, and I still don't know where the truth lies in this one. Their argument is <clears throat> this is only going to affect about. 500 farms that's it it's only about 500 farms uh, and and they, then they say they're going to make about 500 million from it and i'm like well unless every farm's paying a million in tax that can't be true and then you think well 500 million is a drop in the ocean there's no point even doing it and having all the fallout from the policy if that's what you're getting from it you could find those coins down the back of the treasury quite easily and then you've got DEFRA giving a whole new, uh, different level of statistics, saying it's going to be about 37% of farms not affected. Uh, so implying that two thirds will be. And that amount will probably just go up and up and up as things as land gets more expensive, farming equipment gets more expensive. And it, it does seem like a really funny approach. Again, I wonder the cozying up to China and this encouragement for farmers to start selling off fields to avoid having to, or because they'll have to, to pay the in inheritance tax. Is this about sticking the windmills on them and sticking the solar panels on them? Is this, again, because Ed Miliband got out his ukulele, came out of Great British Energy, said, I'm going to come up with all these net zero targets. So they're going to have to put onshore wind somewhere. They're going to have to put solar panels somewhere. So they've got to cozy up to China and they've got to wrestle the farmers' land off them. Is, that, is this just all about net zero? I'm not sure. I think I do think the original reason was to uh, address the almost new trend of people like Jeremy Clarkson, I feel, I feel unfair picking on him, but he sort of put, put himself front and centre of this, who readily admit, I'm going to buy up some farmland to avoid paying tax. I saw Andrew Lloyd Webber on the march and I thought, what bit of farming have you ever done? Yet you say you do farming and you have land. There's one reason for that, it's a tax dodge, right? I think that's why the policy itself could be narrowed. And you should really, I, I, I think Rachel Reeve should only be hitting people with inheritance tax if they sell up. I think if it's going to be passed down to somebody, why, sh why should they be hit by that? And I think inheritance tax is a, not a great thing at the best of times anyway. I'd probably have done and the thing is you could apply the, the policy to cover that. You could apply the policy to cover that, couldn't you? Because Jeremy Clarkson, yeah, you know, there is a clip of him saying, I got this to avoid inheritance tax. But I think he's had a bit of a Damascene re re sort of revolution, hasn't he? He's sort of gone and started farming the, the land himself. And as a, as a result, he's actually rubbed shoulders with the great and the good in agrarian Britain, the Geralds and the Calebs of this world, and suddenly gone, this is actually the reality, and I'm now supporting them. I've seen them. You know, I spent all my time swanning about with, you know, the set in Chipping Norton or whatnot, and now I've had the wake-up call because I've actually stood alongside uh, with the great and the good who look after our pastoral land. So, you know, I, I kind of feel in that respect, you know, people are allowed to suddenly have a wake-up call mm -hmm. and go, I've, I've lived a new experience now. Um, but if you wanted to apply the policy to get the sort of super rich who buy farming land in order that they may then um, just, you know, avoid paying tax, the question should surely be, is that land actually being farmed? And if it is, and it's, you can prove it's an, act, an, a, a, an active farm, then that should probably be some degree of exemption. And you could also go back and say, well, look, if you've bought this land in the last 30 years, sorry, if you then sell it on, you'll be taxed on it. You can create a policy in order to weed these people out, surely. My answer to that be, would be I, I would have never have done the policy. Well, Purely because yeah. you've already pointed out the point that it would bring in 500 million, according to the government's own figures, which is a drop in the ocean when it comes to things like GDP. If you wanted to, you know, address tax concerns, and the problem is when, when there is no money, there's, there's normally two ways of doing things. There is there's other ways that are more complicated, but you either put up taxes or you cut public services. Public services, you know, we're going to have a third of councils going bankrupt over the, this next parliament. You can't be cutting public services anymore. Don't hit an ordinary people with tax rises, but you could put up corporation tax by 1% and bring in 7 billion quid, as it currently stands. Why? And this is my constant, you know, I get unpopular decisions have to be made by governments. Mm. Government is also about trade-offs. You're not always going to be able to get everything you want and you have to meet in the middle on things. Why are we picking arguments with people that, in a way, we can't afford to lose electorally? We've just swept the board on a very built on sand election, yeah. don't get me wrong, in areas where Labour haven't been seen since Tony Blair's era. And there's a lot of MPs going to get dumped out in four years in mm. areas like that because you're being made to be seen to be picking mm. on the, ta the, the farmers. And I think part of that <coughs> is also treasury brain. 
we look at the policy and go, oh, is this that, is what is we can do. Is that a disease that you can catch? I hope not. I hope <laughs> not. I've not stepped foot in, so I'm, I'm all right for now. But I think you don't think about the optics of how this looks. And it's mm. the same with the winter fuel stuff and the negligible amount of money that would bring in as well. Why are we picking arguments with people we can't afford yeah. to pick them with? I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Do you know, my sort of little leftist policy when it comes to taxation would be a luxury goods tax. I think you just had a couple of presented onto a Balenciaga handbag. And all those influencers, they pay it. They don't even follow politics enough to know that um, <laughs> the tax has gone up on that. That'd be it. You know, you want to come and whiz your Ferraris around in Knightsbridge, you've got to pay a bit extra. That's where I'd have put it. <laughs> Matthew, um, excellent to have you in the studio. Thank you so much, my darling. A really good conversation. Enjoyed that thoroughly.